We're rolling. Good. Okay. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 28th of May, 2004, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Harmon Thomas Lamar, born in Dannemora, New York, outside the wall, April 27, 1920. Okay. Uh, Prior to entering military service, what was your educational background? I graduated from high school in Dannemora. Uh, then I went to Holton College for my pre-dental. At that time, it was only two years it was required for, to get a New York State license for pre-dental, rather than the degree as it's required today. Uh, I was quite young uh, to be doing, to uh, get out of uh, high school, going through at this early age. And then I went to McGill, where I was competing with men that uh, already had their degrees. Uh, medicine and dentistry at McGill uh, were the same uh, course the first two years of professional training. Uh, we had 125 medical students and 25 dental students. We worked on the same cadavers, we took the same courses. Uh, we experienced all the required courses together. and. Uh, after that, uh, the last two years, the medical students started uh, delivering babies, whatever the, the medical students do. The dental students started making dentures and uh, uh, taking out teeth, all that kind of stuff. My class was the last class uh, at being taught at McGill that made dentures out of the old-fashioned vulcanite, which is a rubber compound. And then the following year, we switched to um, the acrylics of methyl methacrylate, so stuff bomber noses is made out of. That's what your present dentures are made out of. And this skill has uh, uh, stood me well through all the years. I still employ it today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, uh, when did you leave dental school? When did you graduate? Because our last year at McGill was accelerated, there was no summer vacation. Uh, Financially, I had a rough time at that time. In those days, you couldn't get a, uh, a loan like you do today. My dad had to mortgage a house and so forth. And uh, there were no dental interns uh, in Montreal in the, in the uh, hospitals. So I did my regular dental senior uh, duties as well as performing as an intern at the Children's Memorial Hospital, where I made little partial dentures for Eskimo and Indian children that... Uh, came in and needed a, having a, a hair lip and a cleft palate repaired. Uh, I'd make a little temporary stopping for their palate. The uh, nurses at the time would, uh, the therapists at the time would uh, uh, teach them, the kids how to, to breathe properly, to pronounce the words, and then just talking like that. Mm -hmm. They would uh, learn to project properly and things like this. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, at that time, of course, I'd had a well-developed love life, and my love of my life was, were still together after these 60 years. And she lived in Plattsburgh. She was going to Plattsburgh State. She was taking a home ec. And I was in Montreal, and I didn't have enough money for bus fare. So I used to ride my bicycle down to, to Plattsburgh to see her on weekends in the early summer months. Uh, now, was, was the war... Going on at this point? The war had been going on for quite some time. This was in 1943. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh boy, I lost my steam. You were saying. About oh, yes. Uh, what was very interesting about this, at that time, uh, it was presumed that England was going to be captured by the Germans, that there was going to be a big invasion. And so a superhighway was started at the Canadian border to go through right through to the uh, Canadian Maritimes. And the, the run from the border to Montreal was already in. It's currently now the west side, the, the, the southern side of the Canadian highway where it joins our north way. But I was the only vehicle on that whole road uh, when I went down to visit my sweetie. That was quite an experience. But then when I hit the New York State side, I had to go across the field mm -hmm. to hit Route 9 and come down. Every, I could tell you, every farmer that had a dog, I, I made good time. Now, were you uh, in, in, at McGill when uh, Pearl Harbor 
Yeah. Yes, I was. Do you recall how you learned about it and the reaction? Well, it was in all the radios and mm -hmm. at the time and all the papers, and uh, it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you a, a suffix to that. Uh, in later years, uh, I had as a patient the admiral, the, the Japanese admiral, that led that raid. Uh, he had seen what the atom bomb did, and he was converted to Christianity, and he was on a mission in upstate New York, and he had a little dental problem. I was privileged to uh, do some work for him. I never saw a more disciplined man in my life. He was an open by the numbers, mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, okay, um, now, uh, could you um, tell us, now you said you were in the reserves prior to... Uh, uh, I had signed up in the, for the draft board, and they gave me the privilege to uh, continue in my studies, figuring I'd be more valuable as a dentist than as I would as a rifleman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I followed through from that, and, and I was privileged to uh, be permitted to graduate and uh, to take my state examinations in June. I graduated in February <coughs> 1943. At that time, I was 22 because my birthday is in April. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest graduate of McGill mm -hmm. I've ever had in dentistry. And then uh, I took my state board exams in uh, New York City in 1943, in June. And right immediately thereafter, I was given my notice to uh, enter the service in active duty. I, uh, at the time, of course, living uh, next to Plattsburgh, uh, there was a very nice a uh, place to buy your military uniforms and so forth. So my wife and I were married in, uh, when I had my first uniform, and uh, that's where it all started. Mm -hmm. okay. And from, the, from there I went down to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to what's now the War College, and that was the Medical Field Officer Service uh, School, where all physicians, dentists, and veterinarians got their military indoctrinations, the protocol, uh, uh, sanitation, all the things subject to the medical and allied professions. Mm -hmm. Marvelous uh, course. How long were you there? Uh, five and a half uh, weeks. Mm -hmm. Months, I'll take that. Okay. Five and a half months. Now, uh, after leaving Carlisle, where did you go? Well, my first uh, assignment was to a, a camp house, which was down in the rice fields of Texas. And it was so far out in the boondocks that we're on a little one long uh, train that backed into the former, uh, it had been a former National Guard camp. It was right on Matagora Bay, right back of where the bean cranes come in now. Yeah. But it was so damp down there, holy mackerel. Uh, in the morning you wake up and your brass would be all corroded and the eaves would be dripping and it hadn't even rained. Mm -hmm. But I was there for several months. I was assigned to a regular dental uh, makeup or building. They have, have a, a row of about 20 dentists and so forth. My first patient was remarkable. Uh, he was a nice looking young man and he was sitting in the chair like the other uh, patients on either side of us at all. And I was making small talk and he had to have a lower tooth worked on. So I got out my trusty needle and I was making small talk and I happened to have the needle in front of his nose for a second and he fainted dead away. So that was my beginning of military <laughs> dentistry. <laughs> how, how did uh, the equipment that you had uh, compare to what you were trained on at McGill? Uh, in the uh, dental establishments that the military had uh, made, it was fine. Uh, going overseas with obsolete equipment and what I had to work with over there's another story. We'll get to that. Okay. All right, so after you left Texas, where... Oh, well, How I had quite a few assignments. Okay. I, I went from uh, the place I just mentioned to uh, El Paso, uh, Fort Hood, I think it is. No, uh, whatever it is. And El Paso was right across the river from Juarez, Mexico. Mm -hmm. My wife was with me, of course, all these times. And uh, it was an interesting experience seeing them, just a trickle of water through for the Rio Grande and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it was interesting to watch the young men learning to fly the B-24s. Uh, the level 
of the, of the altitude of the airfield itself was 5,000 feet, and the B-24 didn't have much lift in its wing. They had to be going like the devil. And these kids were cracking those things up all the time. It was a shame to see. But then from there, I was uh, transferred to Fort Lewis, Washington, in, anticip in anticipation of going probably to the Pacific. Uh, I, was, uh, that <coughs> I was reassigned to a, a signal battalion, or um, an engineer combat group, while I was up at, uh, at uh, Fort Bliss. No four buses, or well, whatever. Bliss was in Texas, I think. Yeah, that's the one. It, then the, from Fort Bliss, I went up to the, the one in uh, the state of Washington. Fort Lewis. Right. And I had about oh, three or four months here. At that time, my wife was heavy with child. And I was reassigned to go back to Texas. Well, she blew the whistle. I'm not going to have my baby in Texas. So she took the train home to mother. And I dutifully went back to Texas. This time we were stationed, uh, this is an engineer combat group now, and we were training just north of Dallas in a very nice setup. And uh, uh, well, it's a, yeah, I had, I was into the Delta Tunic one morning, and I had to get there early for some reason. Yeah, the other guy was a, a first officer of the day. And, and uh, so I was in just checking out my dental tools, and the local girls that were helpers came marching in, and I looked up at them with a game of cheery, oh, good morning, how are you this morning, gals? Well, the noses went up and the tails went that way, and nobody talked to me all day long. I thought, what did I do now? I didn't make a pass at anybody, you know, that kind of stuff. Finally, at the end of the day, one of the shyer little girls came over, and she said to me, do you know what you called us? I said, I don't know. She said, you called us gals, and down here, that means blacks. When you do that to a southern Texan at that time, I, that wasn't the right language to use. I found out the hard way. And uh, Tommy, at that time, uh, had entered the scene. Uh, he's here with us today. And uh, I went to uh, put on my boots, and I shook them, and out came a scorpion. Boy, we had to check the bath water for time. We had to keep them soaking in the bathtub. It was so hot down there. It was really something. But then from there, we uh, had one big bash uh, in Dallas at the Tivoli, all the officers and their wives. Then we uh, headed for New York and got ready to get on a troop ship. Uh, in New York City, we had one more bash and went to the Diamond Horseshoe, Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe. And Jinx Falkenberg was the lady of the moment there, and she was entertaining. We had sparkling uh, burgundy instead of champagne. I'll never forget. And that was your wife with you there? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never saw my wife again for a year and a half. Uh, when I came back after a year of hat and a half, uh, she was waiting for me in one of the local hotels in Times Square. And I had been on a troop ship, dirty as a dog, three days in New Jersey getting discharged, and uh, sleeping on the floor where our horses had been and all that junk. And here I had visions of this lovely little fluff just waiting for me passionately. And uh, what should happen, I meet her at the hotel. She opens the door. We hadn't seen each other for 18 months. We were absolutely total strangers. I was embarrassed. She was embarrassed. And the first thing she never forgave me, I showed her was my cameras. <laughs> <laughs> After that, things returned to normal. But now, when you went to, uh, did you go to England or, or right to we, the We uh, were in a large convoy. Okay, so and uh, I had two nefarious associates that kept me occupied playing uh, a, a little card game for matchsticks. One was the Methodist, the Protestant chaplain, and the other one was the uh, uh, Catholic chaplain. Oh, they cheated. It was an awful thing. But it was interesting in that crime boy. Uh, I think we must have had a hundred ships and we went and eventually took a southern route. And on the periphery, as far as we could see, were these corvettes and the destroyers running in a circle guarding us. And then we went into Southampton. Uh, while I was in England, I was transferred from my guys who had been going through training with and all this uh, to a, they changed the, 
the table of organization, the TO, from requiring two dentists down to one. So that left a surplus dentist, and I was a, being the junior dentist in the, in the uh, and that outfit, I was transferred to a signal battalion, and it was a whole new signal battalion. We were Corps troops for the 7th Army, the 21st Corps, and we were uh, stationed at Bournemouth where we finally got acquainted. The medical doctor, who was the head of our medical detachment, I was from Texas, and he was a small, grumbly man, and I thought very disgruntledly about the war. He wasn't very happy with it. Uh, but we had this a darn good uh, sergeant in charge of the enlisted men, and had about 14 enlisted men with our uh, detachment and all. And the, fortunately, the, uh, the soldiers that were in the outfit had had their dental work all completed before I got there, so I was just doing whatever I could to help out. Quite often I'd do the special services officers work and that's a help center of the mail. Uh, quite a few of the fellows were from the south and were illiterate. I had to uh, help them with writing their love letters and reading them for them and this continued right through combat. I tried to fit in anywhere I could. I remember on one occasion uh, the officers were invited to go to the big PX or whatever, BX, whatever it was in England, in uh, London. I picked up my wife a little something or other and a new baby. Then it was later shipped to the States as a little souvenir. Uh, at that night, on that particular night, the V1s were coming in from Germany, or V2s rather, the uh, rockets. Uh, the V1s were the little things that flew over with the interrupted motors and all. I decided not to accept the invitation to stay over. I went back to Bournemouth. That was a lovely city and still is to this day. It was right on the coast. They had a gorgeous beach there. And the they had, English had taken a lot of railroad rails and set them on end or at angles and projected them toward the, the ocean, in the ocean, mm -hmm. to help discourage landing by uh, German craft of any kind. Uh, while I was there, uh, I was privileged to uh, be entertained by some of the local gentry, the officers in our outfit was. And uh, we went to this lovely home, which reeked of antiquity and tradition. Uh, the head lady of the entourage brought us into this lovely uh, meeting room, and it was paneled with the panels from the battleship, the Golden Hind, from Sir Walter Raleigh. It was really something to see in the finger foods and small things were passed around. And uh, I was very proud of the fact that I had my current insignia on. Now the dental insignia uh, is the same as a medical insignia with a D superimposed on it. They didn't know that. So I passed myself off as being a doctor of divinity. I could do no wrong. <laughs> I had fun. But uh, that just about concluded our stay at Bournemouth. Uh, on Christmas Day, unknown to me at the time, the Battle of the Bulge had been on for about 10 days. And our own foot was put in LSTs. <coughs> I don't know how they didn't take the wheels and the defenders off, but those guys were very skilled. And our outfit was transferred up the Loire River, and we landed right in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge. Well, on the way over, I felt so sorry for some of the kids that were manning the ship. I'm speaking as a dentist. Uh, they, they used to have to go in. They had come up from the Mediterranean through southern France, and now here they were in, uh, in northern France, going up the Loire River and so forth. And a lot of them in that age group, your, your soldiers' age groups, are when you get a lot of dental emergencies, you're just cutting new wisdom teeth. Uh, at that time, nutrition wasn't as fresh as it is today. Uh, very few people were taking vitamins. I made it a habit to always take vitamins. I had my unicaps, they were called in those days. But uh, this subjected them to weird conditions that their mouth would break down and so forth. And I had to so treat... So this, this is from scurvy? Yeah, and, uh, uh, what's called trench mouth. Trench mouth. And it's uh, like a, an avitaminosis, a lack of vitamin C and uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, things like that. Uh, at that time, we had no penicillin. We did have sulfur drugs, but they weren't effective against that. So I, we would paint their gums with a cotton swab saturated in uh, chromic acid, which is a styptic, and it would tighten them up, and then 
flush it with peroxide and geez, that would bubble any poisons out and so forth and give them instructions of the proper brushing and home care and all. And that worked in the majority of cases. Uh, when it came to embedded wisdom teeth and all, that was another story. But that and later on in combat, I took care of that otherwise. But these kids, I'll bet you I did an out of my field kit. I couldn't get it in my regular stuff because it's all packed in so tight. I'll bet you I took out a couple dozen teeth on those kids. Uh, they originally, when they went in for fresh supplies, uh, they were indebted to the Navy for any health care. The Navy said, well, go make an appointment with the Navy dentist. Three weeks and three days are out. So these kids never had any help, and that's why I say I mm -hmm. felt so sorry for them. And I, uh, my fellow Americans, I'm very proud of, and I'm proud to be one. And I've always wanted to help. I'm 84 right now, and I'm still doing it. Taking care of a lot of people that have Medicaid and a few dentists will touch. That's another story. So uh, meanwhile, <laughs> back in the Battle of the Bulls, uh, being in a signal battalion was quite a privilege. Uh, the the uh, signal battalion is all the electric stuff. It's radio, it's power, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. We had a lot of generators, things like that. And we also had post hole diggers. And so one guy was assigned to take along a, a big flat board about uh, 12, feet, 14 feet long that had a significant hole, series of holes. And the post hole diggers would accommodate those holes and uh, dig them for us for latrines. So we always had lush, plush, and flush uh, <laughs> facilities in our signal battalion, which wasn't true with a lot of the other troops. Uh, this was a, a very weird time. We, we, as we were going uh, into this forest, I think it was a hurricane forest, <coughs> we saw all the American troops coming back. We said, hey, we're supposed to go here. And our second in command was a young West Point graduate, and he was tougher than nails. He says, we're going there. It says in the map we're going there. There was no way we were going to get there. But uh, they captured quite a few German soldiers at that time, and they interviewed them quite forcefully, believe me. Uh, we had beautiful uh, tents uh, that were heavily coated with uh, light-proof doors. Uh, we had little uh, gasoline stoves for heat. Uh, I, before I left New York, went to Abercrombie and Fitch and picked up a beautiful uh, sleeping bag, down-filled sleeping bag. Had a lot of little foam chips in the bottom of it. I was used to camping and so forth, being a North Country boy. So I stocked up on some of the goodies to make sure I never suffered much. Uh, my wife had a grandmother that was most considerate, and she gave me two sets of uh, sheepskin uh, slippers. Well, in the Battle of the Bulls, there was a lot of fo trench foot. Trench foot uh, was uh, due to the fact that the fellows just had leather boots. Uh, they didn't have changes of socks. Their feet never dried up for days on end in this sub-zero weather. It was one of the coldest winters in Europe at that time. And they had a long time. And uh, they would incapacitate them. They, they just had to quit. They couldn't stand on their feet. They had to be sent back. And uh, when the Sorrells, or the new modern rubber-based boots, came out, why well, uh, that was great, but the guys in the back got those. They weren't out front. So in the meantime, I gave one set of the uh, slippers to the doctor in my outfit, and I had the other set, we put them in our overshoes, and that worked out well. Uh, I take An officer had not only a sleeping bag, but he also had a, <coughs> a, a, his own bedroll. And in the bedroll, any of your personal things, your shaving stuff, uh, extra socks, underwear, things like this, you uh, took right along with you. And uh, <coughs> those things were rolled up. So uh, right during combat, we uh, had a double helmet, the outside helmet being the, the metal heavy one. And we had a little uh, sterno stove. And we'd get, get, fill up a, one of our uh, th things you drink out of. Uh, Canteen. Canteens with water, hot water, if we could get it. Or, or let's put a little heater under the uh, thing and put it in there. Uh, we'd wash up, we'd shave, whatever we wanted to do. And then the last thing was put in our former day's socks and underwear. Uh, rinse them out real good, put them in the sleeping bag. By the time I needed them, the next day they were dry. So we survived going through it, uh, things like that. Uh, it worked out. It's quite ingenious the way we got things going. Now you, uh, I 
know you got a picture here of a uh, dental truck. That this is what you well, were this in. This was right? after kind This of. was after. Okay. What kind of vehicle or? How okay. You okay. Now, when it came how to vehicles, carried? when it came to vehicles, our medical detachment had a, a six by six and, and a couple of three quarter ton trucks and trailers, mm -hmm. and I was the, and my driver were there in the last truck and a trailer. Now, at the end of the uh, first part of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, there was still German resistance in Colmar. Col Colmar was uh, south of us in the Vosges Mountains. And our unit, uh, uh, being a signal battalion, uh, did all the uh, communications between the divisions, Army headquarters, and the French battalion, which was on our south. Patton was on our north with the 3rd Army. We were 7th Army, and then the French were on our southern flank. Mm -hmm and we provided all the communications. At that time, it was uh, the first time I saw radar used, or uh, FM rather, FM line of sight transmission. And uh, the, the TACO antenna company had developed these uh, setups and the, the wire teams weren't needed anymore. In other words, they didn't have to go out and lay wires for communications at all, in, in some instances. And uh, that was my first vision of that. Now, in traveling in our trucks, our trucks all had uh, little baby bullseyes of lights. The, the lights were all shielded, and as the headlights and the taillights. Mm -hmm. We also had on the front uh, triangulated uh, bars of steel that came up about six feet from the front bumper, and it had a notch on the top. That was to cut any cables the enemy might put across the road, which were very helpful. We had very good discipline about our vehicles, as far as driving off the sides of the road, turning around and all. Um, we were, all, all the officers, especially the officers, were well trained in uh, avoiding landmines uh, until the, the uh, new type landmines that the Germans developed, the glass mine. And the, the, there was no way that our mine detectors could spot them until later the radar type devices came out. Well, on our way down in Colmar, we're in the Vosges Mountains, and if you've ever driven in a convoy, the guys in front are doing 50, and you're back there just crawling, and then all of a sudden you got to catch up with them. Well, I had a southern guy as our driver, and officers weren't supposed to drive a vehicle. Well, I'm a North Country boy, and these were snowy roads, and no guardrails on these mountain roads. So I said, Janisinski, move over. I'm taking over. This is my kind of stuff. So we made it, and we, we got it through the, all the things okay. Now, were all your vehicles marked with red crosses? Oh, uh, just in the medical units? detachment. The rest of them were red. Well, I just meant is the, the medical Oh, units. yes. And I always wore my bristride. I uh -huh. still have it uh -huh. at home. Kind of dirty and worn, but I'm very now, Did you carry any sidearms or weapons? Oh, uh, there was a rumor that if any of the Germans ever found anybody with a red cross in their arm uh -huh. and, and with a weapon, they put it right in the roof of their mouth and blew their head mm -hmm. off. So at that time, I, I didn't. Uh, later in combat, I picked up a 45, and then I picked up a nice little Walther 32. And uh, I was pretty well, the, the war was pretty well over by then. Mm -hmm. I didn't worry about it. I just kept looking for souvenirs then. Yeah. Um, you, uh, now you had mentioned in uh, the form that you filled out that you had captured some Germans. Was that in the bulge, or was that after the bulge? That was after the bulge, after we crossed. Now, uh, while we were still in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, we went up to, to, we were in a concern, uh, or a, a, it's a place where the soldiers have the barns and all the equipment to take care of things. Uh, unknown to me, I didn't realize what was going on. Um, it was a, a place called, it's spelled B-I-T-C-H-E. And later I had a, a, an Episcopal priest in my chair. And I said, well, Father, remember when we were in Bitch, uh, we had that stalemate there before we crossed the Rhine? He says, Doctor, that's B-I-T-C-H-E. That is Bichet. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, while we were there, uh, here I had this lousy field equipment that went back to World War One. The old okay, treadmill. could you describe the equipment? You alluded to that earlier, so you right. basically World War One equipment? That I went overseas with. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, uh, we went into this, uh, I went to the military government where uh, we were stationed nearby, and I asked him, do you know where there's a dental office? I want to get some equipment out of here. 
So they said, well, I can't tell you, but there's one over there. <laughs> so, so this guy, uh, German, uh, it was on, in Alsace Lorraine, and that's half German, half French anyway. That's where my ancestors were from, my father's side, as a matter of fact. So uh, I found this, German, this uh, French collaborator at his office. I relieved him of a few extra choice forceps and other paraphernalia. And then uh, I took all the, he had a beautiful modern drill set up with a foot control, the electric motor, and the uh, belts and all the wheels and all the rest of the whatever. And uh, my boys being as very clever in the signal battalion, we had all kinds of generators. So they built a little box for me. They had all this equipment in it. I had a Jeep light. I had a collapsible chair. And I was in heaven. I was in all set to work again. So in this concern, my own troops were in good shape. But what one part of the Battle of the Bulge was the fact that uh, we could, there were so many tanks on both sides involved, and the Germans, once their tanks got hit, had no way of repairing them. We had tank, re tank retrievers, and in this concern, they would drag in the regular, the, the beat up tanks, put on whatever they repair them, and so forth. And a lot of these kids needed dental work done, so even though they weren't in my own outfit, they were still American soldiers. And I uh, took care of a heck of a lot of them, and I uh, did a lot for them. Now, did you ever uh, treat wounds where maybe the, the doctors, medical doctors, were overloaded with wounded? Were you ever, did you uh, I was privileged not to have to be involved in any situation such as that. But I'd like to finish with it where I am okay. now. I'm in this concern, and now, uh, whoops. Oh, boy. Just give me a second. I'll just shut the camera down for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, go ahead. After we left this concern, uh, we were getting ready to, to cross the line. Now, the Siegfried line was right over the Rhine from where we were. And our unit was, was going up uh, toward that area. And uh, holy mackerel, the, the, the spies on our side would radio the guys over there as to how the German 88s were coming in and where they were hitting. And our battalion took over a schoolhouse in Strasbourg or someplace, something like that. <coughs> and we were being shelled, and I'm telling you, I was never so scared in my life. It's just like being in this room and the shells were landing in that road. And those things went off, and I didn't know if I was going to dig up or down or crossway. But fortunately, there was only one poor kid that got um, killed in that, and he was the guard for the motor pole. And the rest of us uh, made it through that okay. And we had one wire team that had gone out, and they were sleeping in a basement, and somebody had zeroed the Germans in as to where to blow them up and all. But then after that, in Remagen, apparently some of the guys got across the Rhine and started the, the advance. Uh, we crossed it at uh, Worms, where, and in a oh, fantastic uh, smoke screen. Uh, we uh, just didn't want to take any chance on aerial protection. So, geez, we could hardly see the boats ahead of us, but they loaded us on Bailey Bridges, and we drove across and took off. Now, at that time, uh, we were in another German city, and I, that's where you were bring, mentioning this um, incident I had with the German soldiers. We had an idiom in the signal corps. When in doubt, follow the spiral four. Now, the spiral four is used today. You'll see it's that heavy coaxial cable that goes uh, from one telephone pole to another. And um, <coughs> there are different couplers and so forth for those. So I was trying to help out as a special service officer. And we had a, a pigeon outfit uh, that sent capsules with whatever information and so forth with us. And they needed to get their mail. And I had some Red Cross stuff for them and some reading and chocolate bars and cigarettes and that kind of stuff. So I took my driver and I. And, I checked out my coordinates, and they said, well, then I'll follow the spiral floor. So I was driving along, and I could follow this wire. And the wire seemed to be getting farther and farther away. And I thought, hey, this is great. So I, I rounded this corner in the edge of the city, about the size of Albany, and here's a big tiger tank just sitting there. I said, gee, it's funny it's not burning. So I didn't make, pay any attention to it. So I went around the corner, and here's a big rock. And holy mackerel, six German puts their hands over their heads. 
and surrendered right then and there. Well, I had the Red Cross on the truck, thank God. So I put them in. I said, oh, Rouse, let's get out of here. So back we went into the town where we were, our city where we were going. And here's these MPs and all these prisoners coming in. They got the submachine guns. He says, well, look at me. He sees the Red Cross and sees a prisoner. He said, get out of here, you crazy medic. <laughs> <laughs> he took over. I never got any credit for it, but at least I was alive. But apparently I just wasn't much of a target for that tag or tag thing. Goodness. So that was that experience. Okay, um, do you have any other experiences you want to share? Well, from then on out, uh, <coughs> nightly we were in long convoys. I mean, uh, we, we'd drive along through the, the, the main highways and you'd see where we had mountains, mounds of shells just, just all over the place where our artillery had just wiped out anything ahead of us. Uh, really something to see. Uh, we went to a, through one little lovely village in southern uh, Germany called Toberbischofsheim. And that's, I don't know why that sticks with me, it's a ten dollar word, but there was a lovely medical school there. And so the doctor and I being curious went down into their library to to see what they were teaching their students and all. They had beautiful equipment. And of course our troops all went in and they stole the, the lenses out of the microscopes and then threw them away a couple of days later. Just not understanding what they had. But uh, they showed us, or the doctor and I uh, projected some of the movies these guys had taken. And apparently they had exposed some captured uh, prisoners to exorbitant uh, doses of x-ray to take uh, motion pictures of arms moving and legs moving and to get the physiology, the, the mo studies of motions of those things. They must have given them horrible uh, radiation burns. They probably sacrificed them after that. Uh, as we continued along, uh, I was in one little town about the size of my little village, Keysville, where I am now. And the, and the chief industry there was uh, making little plates and all, and they used to make us uh, um, eating kits for the German soldiers and all. And uh, I had a nice farmhouse I stayed in, they had a beautiful Grundig radio, uh, very much like what we're making today and this being shipped to this country. Only at that time, of course, they had tubes instead of transistors mm -hmm. and so forth, but it was AM, FM, shortwave. I was thrilled with the sound. And, so I liberated one of those, and I liberated a, a thermos bottle to me, which was a, a treasure and a luxury because I could always have hot coffee when I was traveling. And of course, hot liquids help peristalsis, your, your whole digestive system, things like that. Uh, in this one town, I, we were there for about two weeks, and uh, there was a dental office there in a nice German home. So uh, I went down and met the, the wife of this dentist who had uh, who was a German soldier himself. Uh, he was a dentist connected with the German MPs and he was up in the Russian front. As far as I know, he was he's still cutting rocks. I don't know, poor guy. But she was a very nice person. She had, and uh, there was a beautiful dental office, double chairs, the latest Siemens equipment and all. And I was thrilled to, to have it to work with. And so I did a lot of work for my troops there. Uh, that's one when I got into getting out those impacted wisdom teeth and mm -hmm. embedded wisdom teeth. Uh, on the way through, we had assigned to us uh, two professional photographers from Chicago. Uh, at one time, we took over in one German city, a, uh, um, at Gestapo headquarters. And in the Gestapo headquarters, they had all kinds of photographic equipment, all different grades of paper, enlargers. Uh, they had little kits to uh, make sending spies on their way. They, they had suits with cigarettes and uh, suitcases, a whole bit to, to set up a, a, a sting operation like that. So these uh, professional photographers uh, taught me basic photography, how to dodge, vignette, all of the, the, some of the tricks and the enlarging, all that stuff, and different grades of paper. Later on I got some books and studied the whole chemistry and background of it. So these same guys came over and they photographed me taking out some of these teeth and so forth. And they were in the eyes, archi uh, archives somewhere. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that was 
another experience. Now, did you have any problems, uh, you know, getting like Novocaine or Amalgam, uh, you know, to oh, the teeth with? Uh, there's no problems. Uh, uh, we had excellent uh, sources for our dental supplies. Uh, speaking of Amalgam, uh, in this one dental office I just mentioned to you, the nephew of the dentist uh, helped me find out where things were, and, and he was a nice kid. He was bilingual. And uh, I said, well, what did, the, what did your uncle use to fill teeth? Because Hitler had taken all the gold and all the silver. He said, we used to eat a compact uh, tinfoil. Hmm. And that's what they had to use, poor guys. Hmm. So from there in the combat, well, we carried on. And then that's when we went by Munich. Uh, on the outskirts of Munich, it's, there's a, it's a long, beautiful valley plain. And uh, they had the, the super highways were magnificent, like we have now, but we never had anything like that at that time. And they, like you have your double highway here, your other dying way here. And then the cement in between was painted green. And all along the sides were these beautiful jets, the 262s? Yes. I mean, 262s. And holy mackerel, if they had ever gotten after our bombers, we wouldn't have had a chance. But our bombers had gotten rid of their oil supply and things like that. Thank goodness. Uh, in that same period, uh, we liberated Dachau, and uh, that, that was terrible to see these poor people who were just walking skeletons. Boy, and did they wham the Germans in that village. They got out and what they did to them. <laughs> I didn't blame them. Terrible thing. Now, were you aware of any of these camps prior to... I wasn't too versed in that stuff. No, I wasn't. But uh, I sort of got caught on it in a hurry. Then after that, we advanced so fast. Uh, there was, it was customary in that, it probably is today, each little village had its own winery. And our troops would get into that winery, they'd get a hold of some of this wine, and the, like they're making champagne, the mother was selling, the bacteria count was high. They'd drink that stuff and get sick. Oh, man. So we had to take the booze away from them. So when it came to VE Day, our troops had no, nothing to celebrate with. I, felt, I took that to heart. I'd been up to the top of the... Uh, Zooks, or the um, Hitler's hideaway, and, yes. and I saw Goring surrender. Uh, boy, that, he came in in the most beautiful electric train you ever saw. Had bofers on either end, and everything was spit and polish, and it was great. He was resplendent in his, he was a big man, mm -hmm. and a beautiful white uniform with all the gold piping on him, holy mackerel. Thought he could have won the war by himself on the looks of things. So anyway, I, I checked uh, with our uh, commanding officer, I said, well now, when we're back in Munich, I know where there's a brewery. Give me a command car and a three-quarter ton truck and I'll at least get some beer for the kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I took that bunch and we went into uh, Munich. And as I went by this place, I finally found it again. And uh, here's a guy who's speaking fluent English, if you can call it an Austrian, uh, Australian English. Uh, he said, aye, Captain, what's up? I said, well, we're looking for some beer. He said, aye, well, I spent, he says, I was captured in South Africa. They, they brought me up here, and they made me work here, and I had my own girlfriend, my old setup, and I kept the brewery running. He says, I know the brewmaster. He says, come in, and we'll fix you up. So we brought the vehicles in, and we do, he dutifully, the brewmaster, recorded the serial numbers on all the kegs. And so forth, and I assumed he was probably getting him off the, our unit's number. So when I signed the thing, I can't, signed the Captain Zilch to the Horse Marines. I always <laughs> kept that copy with me. So the boys had something to celebrate with. Uh, another thing that happened after that, we hadn't had uh, much cleanliness. And we were going so fast at that time, this is prior to VE Day, VE day officially, uh, to get a good bath was something else. So there was a bath unit that showed up, and they took every stitch of clothes we had, and even my nice clothes I'd gotten in Amber, I have a Grumpy and Fitch and all, had to take off my own, uh, all my um, paraphernalia, you know, your rank and all that stuff. And I had to sew it on these clothes they gave us that just about fit. But boy, that was having to get in a nice warm hot bath and get scrubbed down and all. And, uh, then after that, our outfit got transferred to uh, uh, North East Germany. And uh, we watched the Russians come in. And we just gave them all that land that the English 
uh, and the Americans had fought for it at Leipzig. And uh, while in Leipzig, I saw the damn things. It was, a, it was a lovely city, much like Albany, and I hadn't been hit too bad. And so uh, our medical detachment would be upstairs playing cards or something, the other troops. They really didn't have too much to do, just guard duty, things like that, waiting for the Russians to come. And uh, in anticipation of the Russians coming, uh, it was customary for an officer to have liquor rations. Every month he got a couple of bottles of rye, scotch, whatever. And uh, I'd like to let it age and so forth in the appropriate time. Well, everybody else had run out of booze. So when the uh, Russian officers came to join us for a meal and get acquainted, uh, they had to use my booze for the Russian officers. And I kind of spit, but I went through with it. Well, they were okay. They, they were just doing their duty. The German women uh, welcomed the Russians. I was in the last vehicle, the last American vehicle to leave, and I, they would hang out these red flags. I thought, where the devil did they get the red flags? Well, the regular flags the Germans had been displaying was a big, long red flag with a, with a swastika in the white field with a black swastika. Mm -hmm. Well, they just cut that section out and welcomed the Russians with those. I picked up one of the swastika flags and brought it home and gave it to an old friend late years later. Now, did, what were your feelings about the Russians? Uh, they didn't have an original thing with them. Everything they had, they either, either confiscated from the Germans or uh, we gave them. But they certainly were dedicated. They were miserable and they knew what to do and they knew how to shoot. And uh, thank God they were on our side at that time. Mm -hmm. but we didn't have much to do with them. Uh, from there on out, our uh, unit headed to uh, Paris, and then the unit was disbanded. <coughs> Broke my heart to say goodbye to the guys, but uh, some of them went home, and in the meantime, being a, a younger officer, a lot of the older dentists uh, went back to the States. But they uh, gave me that truck you saw with the Red Cross on it. Uh, as I you hold this up like this in front of you and tell us where and when that was taken? Well, I was driving uh, on one of the autobahns, and I was stopped, uh, trying to get my ways and so forth. And the Red Cross uh, had donuts and stuff, and they had a assembly truck. And these wise guys would pull up and say, hey, Doc, you got any donuts? <laughs> but that was uh, on the way back to Southern Bavaria, back to Bachnum, where I was finally stationed. Mm -hmm. uh, Bachnum was a little German town that the chief industry was uh, making things out of leather and different crafts, these beautiful uh, inlaid uh, pictures that they would make out of different cuts of wood and all. Yeah, they're very beautiful work, things like that. So this dentist and myself took over the uh, this one house that had been, had been occupied by the military. It was a big house and he did the fillings and extractions and uh, I did the lab work. Now, <coughs> uh, the denture work and so forth and I got a special uh, type of they called me a prosthodontist at that time, where I did nothing but uh, re replacing teeth rather than taking them out and on. So I uh, took care of the troops, or this other dentist and I took care of the troops that didn't have a dentist of their own. Uh, finance companies had about a dozen people, uh, truck driving outfits, uh, all small units, uh, transportation units, things like this. Uh, it was a lovely home. and. Uh, the old colonel who was the head of the uh, transportation outfit, or the, uh, gave out the money, whatever it was, finance outfit, paid all the troops and all, was quite a scrounger. He was originally from North, uh, Winston Salem, an old banker, and he knew his money, and he knew how to live, and he lived like the cigars, and might have a little female help on the side, I suppose. So uh, every night we had fabulous meals. He'd gotten a hold of a cook who had been on the supply ship to the Graf Spey, which had been an ocean uh, liner that had gone from Germany to Argentina, where a lot of the beef came from for Germany, in Germany in the, before World War II. So boy, could this guy cook. We had champagne, you name it, every night. What a way to go. And I didn't have my sweetie with me, darn it. <laughs> <coughs> so one day, I was, and we work with with uh, little Bunsen burners, like with alcohol, to melt our waxes and all. And I needed some, so I 
went up to Frankfurt and took my, I had a sergeant who was a heck of a nice kid at the time, and uh, he, he and I went up to Army headquarters and I requisitioned some dental supplies and I got, I wanted five gallons of grain of uh, uh, denatured alcohol for my lamps. So I asked the supply surgeon, he said, well, Captain, all I can give you is grain alcohol. Well, that's 180 proof pure booze. Well, I grumbled about it and got in the car and half the, or my Jeep and halfway back, I thought, hey, this is a pure quill. Well, after that, I distributed in very small cans to my supply sergeant. Now, I need new Jeeps, or, uh, new uh, shocks for my Jeep, so forth, and traded for this and that. So I lived high in the hog from then on out. Uh, I also had working for me uh, two German and two Czechoslovakian dentists. Uh, they supplemented my American technicians. That I had two of those guys. And uh, now, did they speak English or they bilingual? Well, I had one guy, uh, Dr. Knapp, mm -hmm. and uh, he was he was a nice little guy, and very very uh, great, very nice personality. He knew his stuff, and he intervened inter 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 for me. And it was funny, at that time, a person of color, we call them today, the blacks, were a, a, a rarity in Germany. They were, as a matter of fact, in, even in uh, dental school, they probably never seen it inside of a, a black person's mouth. Uh, some things unique to the black is if they'd stuck to this same tribe and so forth, here you have generations, a hundred generations to perfect heredity, things like that. They get that beautiful dental arts, a smile things like that, and the gums are stippled with the pigmentation and so forth, to the colors, and the, uh, they call it things like that. These were a textbook rarity to these foreign dentists. So uh, Dr. Knopp came over one day, he says, do you suppose that soldier would mind if he looked in his mouth? So uh, I explained to uh, the soldier, not at all. <coughs> so we all got along pretty fine with that. And in the meantime, his buddy was the, the soldier that was being worked on sitting there looking at me, gave me a big grin, and he lit up the room with it. He said, Doctor, do you suppose you could make a nice gold tooth for a year? <laughs> I'd rather cut off my arm than sacrifice a perfectly good central incisor. So uh, that's some of the things. I, uh, this guy was quite a scrounger. He needed some overshoes and things like that. I got some stuff for him. I ended up getting a nice camera from him. The, kind of the barter system worked very well at that time. So. Uh, I guess that didn't end of that episode pretty well. I, worked the, I wasn't too far from where some of the famous uh, German prisoners were stationed. I had to do some dental work for some of them, too. I forget their names now, but they were famous at the time. Then finally, I, uh, it was Christmas Day, and I had a chance to uh, just goof off. So I wrote my own orders, and I took another dentist with me, my two lab men and, and a Jeep, and. Uh, decided to go back into France and do some skiing. Now, as a kid in Danamore, I used to do a lot of skiing. I had ski jumps and jump barrels and skates, all that kind of stuff. I thought I'd be in the same situation again. Well, these guys were doing alpine skiing like they do today. <coughs> and I can say I wasn't in the right place at all. They were just going like this, and I'm used to going down like that. So we moved, and we uh, took this Alp German the uh, Adolf Hitler Highway that goes through southern France, uh, corner of, of Germany, and then back into Austria. And uh, it was in the winter, as I said, and we were the last vehicle to go. Uh, I had uh, relieved a German ambulance of a field radio and, uh, I could, and a heater. I had it in their Jeep, and I could get the CBC, I could get Radio Canada, uh, Voice of America hadn't quite come on at that time, but uh, we, we had it made, so here we are going through the Adolf Hitler Highway, and I could see this magnificent mountain ahead of me, and not knowing what it was, uh, I saw this cable car going up, but well, as a young fellow in this country, I'd been over in Cannon Mountain, there's a little cable car there, it's a nice place. So uh, I thought, well, this would be nice, fellas, what do you say we go? Well, the guy that ran the thing was so cordial. He was delighted to see some more American troops. Apparently, it had just been vacated by uh, American troops and some French occupation force had come. He wasn't taking too kindly of that. So he welcomed us aboard. So we ride up this beautiful cable car up this pretty big mountain. And I thought, well, we, 
must be getting pretty close to the top, and here comes this cable car, and we could see way off in the distance, and there's still mountains ahead. Well, it kept climbing and climbing, and it started, the wind started blowing, that car started swinging, and there was nothing lower than that floor I could hang on to. Well, we finally got to the top of the Zugspitz, and it's a mountain that uh, you can see five countries from, and it's tied, tied to Garmisch. Parkenkirchen, which is the Lake Placid of Germany, on the other side. You can come up either in the cable car or a cog railway on the other side. They give you a medal when you get there. When I got home, I couldn't even drive over the sandbar bridge at Burlington or Whiteface Highway. I don't know being shelled or going up that, <coughs> that uh, cable car was the worst experience I had there. But that kind of ends that up. So, when did you go home? Well. As luck would have it, uh, I got an order in that spring of, I guess that would be 46, I guess, and to uh, leave on my birthday from the Harve, the Harve, France. And kind of find that it was April 27th. There was snowing there in the Harve. My wife said it was snowing in Morrisonville. So uh, then you heard about the episode in New York City and how we greeted each other and so forth. And uh, the okay, rest is um, history. Did you uh, join any veterans groups when you returned home? At all? Uh, well, uh, in the North Country, my uncle, who was a dentist in Denimore, they got me interested in the profession, I was a legionnaire. So I always belonged to the American Legion, and I joined the Elks. Oh, in Plattsburgh, it was great. They had the slot machines in, used to pay for a lot of the things. It was great. Uh, I was a joiner then. I joined Kiwanis. I was a, mm -hmm. we joined everything and started PTA in the schools. In our local school, it was influential in getting an, an elementary school going, and uh, took my son's sons uh, to a scout camp. My wife did her duty for the Girl Scouts, and we did a lot of civic things and for our churches. And carried on like that, and I'm very proud of my family. My son went to dental school where I did. My other son uh, uh, went to Plattsburgh and graduated where his mother was. We had three generations that graduated from the Plattsburgh uh, College, so we're Right, and then two other girls, two of the girls are, uh, had their own families and uh, made a career of getting divorces. They both had uh, three divorces. But they, I love them all, and I'm blessed I have them all. And, and at 84, we still have all each other. I've been very could you, privileged. Could you tell me how you think your time in the service maybe changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I don't know how to how to explain that other than the fact that it made every precious, every moment more precious with my wife. And I was always true to her and she was to me. And it strengthened that bond. And uh, remember, I used to have to teach the stuff for the medical officers, not only about brushing teeth, but their genitalia and everything else. So and I make sure my nose was kept clean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thanks for your cooperation. I hope